morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris Fintech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gotkin, and today I'm joined by the co-founder and CEO of one of the world's biggest fintechs, Klarna. Sebastian Simiatkowski, great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, so before we get cracking, uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about Klarna. Okay, now, uh, Sebastian, anyone who knows even a tiny bit about fintech will probably already know that you are a pioneer in the buy now, pay later or BNPL space. So perhaps you can just give us an overview of of Klarna as a company today. Sure. Um, Yeah, that's probably one of the things we're most famous for. But actually, the way I think about Klarna today is more as a third party network. So we obviously have the four party networks of Visa and MasterCard who um, I, in my opinion, due to the digitalization we're going through, has a challenge because if you want to innovate, they have to go to the consumer, to the consumer bank, to the merchant, to the merchant bank. They have uh, multiple parties and they need to convince all of them of adopting new technologies and new services. Third party networks like Klarna, Amex or PayPal have the benefit of basically having the merchant and the, uh, the Adyen or the Stripe that we work with that have their relationship with the merchant, but then directly with the consumer. So any new technologies, any services that we provide, we can roll out enti- very much quickly. We can get 150 million consumers to adopt them and uh, we can just align with our merchants. So that's kind of what we think. And, and yes, buy now, pay later is part of that. But uh, it's important to remember as well that 40 percent of the transactions on our network are actually uh, debit pay now right so it's a mix um, uh, it's a mix on the network but uh, I do think that the fact that we provided a more attractive form of credit that what you see on Visa and MasterCard allows credit that in our world we deem very predatory with very high APRs with revolving and other uh, schemes that are really there to make consumers spend and borrow more than they should at higher cost so our form of credit is uh, more consumer friendly and that's the the one we want to see on our network. And, and I think that's one that has become famous as buy now, pay later. Sure. And of course, earlier this year, there was talk of a new funding round for Klarna that could see your valuation jump from $46 billion up to up to $60 billion. Where do we stand on that? <laughs> I don't know. There, I, we never comment on rumors, uh, so we'll see. But I mean, have market jitters that we've seen uh, and you know big drops in the valuations of listed fintechs, has that affected any negotiations that you may or may not be having? Well, you look, I think to me, it's kind of natural that you will see swings in the market over time, right? You got to remember that I've been doing this for 17 years now, kind of crazy, um, since I was 23 when I started. And over those years, I've seen things up and I've seen things down. And um, But I think if you zoom out a little bit, in my perspective, it's like, um, I, I believe right now we're in a very and you know exciting time because and it reminds me a lot of like 2009 where Zalando and Amazon were seeing tons of traction you started seeing them growing fast and the traditional retailers were like this is not going to work they're not going to be successful and investors some of them really believed in it but some investors were more like is the business model really going to work is this going to be profitable and, and and today these companies have had a you know profound impact on 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 retail and I think that we're in a similar place when it comes to retail banking, where we're seeing companies like Klarna, like uh, Revolut, like uh, uh, you know some of the other neo banks, fintech, etc., that is having serious traction. Um, you know, then when it comes to multiples in the kind of very right now, you know, sometimes investors get ahead of themselves, sometimes they get more nervous, and things go a little bit up and down like that. But on the long term, are we seeing fintech disrupting? Banking, my opinion is absolutely yes. The customer adoption is there, the usage is there. Um, but as we all know, you know the hype curves and stuff. But like over time, it's still uh, it transforms an industry, and that's what we're going on. But maybe the you know the kind of end date or the I think the date when it will all be very apparent to us is, could be as much as you know seven eight years out in the future when we will look back and say, like we do today with retail, like wow, Amazon really profoundly changed the space, right? And uh, obviously, you get this asked this all the time in terms of an IPO. Uh, you can just give me a yes, no or something. Are, are you planning one right now or still not planning one right well, now? Well, one thing that I'm actually happy about is due to the, you know, yeah. So in, in autumn, when I was asked this question, I said, look, I, I don't think it's great to IPO when markets are that volatile and, and so forth. And, and uh, this time I, I seem to have been lucky in the sense that 
I, I was right about that. But uh, that's obviously luck, because I don't think you can predict these things. But, but, um, but um, you know, I, I hope maybe now after, you know, now they've been very volatile, obviously, again. But maybe finally, after this correction, there will be a slightly more, uh, you know, stable time period. And that is a, a period that I think is as attractive as one where you would consider to IPO. But there's no immediate plans for it. Sebastian, I've got to ask you, what's it like having Snoop Dogg among your investors? Do you kind of chat with him much about you know, uh, yeah. uh, revenues and stuff? Yes, I mean, no, no, not really, but but I'm very proud of having him. And I think, you know, there's something about when we when that happened and, and also the transition of our brand and so forth, I think that there has been this very antiquated idea among banks that trust is communicated and enabled through a lot of middle aged white men in marble offices, in suits, in ties, right? And that that somehow should represent trust. And uh, and I think the modern consumer doesn't see it that way. They actually maybe, you know, they despise Wall Street. They despite a lot of the things that happened in 2007. There is a very strong anti-sentiment. And I think today speaking, you know, very sophisticated language or trying to make things look more complex than they are is not really something that builds trust. It's the opposite. It's being approachable, being available, speaking the language of the customer. And so to me, the whole transition with Snoop Dogg is very much about if I want consumers of all ages and all backgrounds to engage with me on the topic of financial services, do you think I'm going to be successful doing that in a tie, in a suit, in a marble office, or if I have Snoop Dogg talking to them? And so I think that like, you know, as much as this industry has pretended to be interested in, you know, financial education, financial proficiency among its users, they have not really, in my opinion, been creative and smart about the tools and the methodologies that they apply to really reach out to people and to connect with people, to be approachable and available. Uh, you know, a bank may do nice education in schools, but when I call customer service, it's unavailable uh, in evenings or whatever, right? So they're only open on office hours. So like, I think there's, uh, this industry has a lot to rethink when it comes about truly building trust in, in the way we humans uh, you know, appreciate what a, a person I trust look like. So I th I'm very happy to have Snoop Dogg as part of that transition of art. Okay, I'm sure sure he's very happy too uh, with the uh, increase in valuation since he uh, got on board. But look, so we've heard a bit about Klarna now. Uh, let's now get to know Sebastian a little bit better. Okay, so uh, as your name might suggest, Sebastian, uh, you and your family, I think, are originally from Poland, but immigrated to Sweden in 1980, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you came along a year later. I understand it wasn't necessarily the easiest of childhoods. Is that right? No, I mean, again, I, I you know, it's always when you talk about these things, it's difficult because there's obviously people that have had much more challenging upbringings than I do. But I, I do think, you know, as you, you've grown and you reflect on these things, I I, I definitely believe that there is a reason why like 50% of, of tech companies in the US are uh, founded by immigrant kids. I think there's something about when you grow up and you to some degree on some level understand or appreciate the fact that your you know family and your, your parents have really given up on everything, given up on friends, given up on their language, their understanding of the culture and moved to a very different environment basically because they're hoping to give you as their child a different um, prerequisites to be to, to have a different life. Um, and that's a massive sacrifice. And so I do think it, it creates some kind of, you know, drive or, or, or passion to try to to cre create a different life. And, and that was the case for me. I mean, my, my parents came to Sweden. It was difficult at that point in time with the Polish surname to to get a job. They did do actually well for a while but then they divorced and my father got unemployed uh in during the financial crisis in sweden and i remember my father being unemployed or just having like short-term jobs or right you know driving a cab there wasn't always uh food at the table uh in the sense i mean it wasn't like we were starving or anything but there were there were definitely you know empty fridges now and then <laughs> and i had to eat a lot of pancakes which i actually appreciate i loved pancakes so um uh, uh, they kind of more crepes really Swedish pancakes, but um, so um, so yeah. So I think that like, and I think it affects you. And I think to some degree, I felt 
you know, my parents, very intellectual, very, you know, educated, but no, absolutely not given the opportunity to live up to their full potential. And, and at the same point of time, you know, people, you know, I, I remember there were areas of Uppsala, my hometown, where people with a little bit more money lived in, in houses and they were doctors and so forth. And, and we were living in a small apartment um, and didn't have the same financial means. And I obviously definitely felt like, like, it's almost like a lack of fairness. Now life isn't supposed to be fair, but like there was this lack of like, you know, I think why, why can't we have it like they have it? Like, you know, and, and I think that, that definitely created a, a, a drive, right? Right. And I think when you were growing up, you also received a, a subsidized computer from the Swedish government. Uh, was that kind of where your love affair with kind of technology began? I mean, yes, to some degree. I, I, I unfortunately, well, fortunately and fortunately, unfortunately, I got a Mac instead of PC. And I think almost like I would have probably been actually been able to code if I would have had a PC because it on the Mac, you couldn't really do anything because Steve Jobs had created this beautiful user interface. So there was much more limitation. Um, the only thing I was doing was like writing scripts in HyperCard. Some people may remember that software. And so I could program a little bit and I tried and so forth. But I really loved playing around with computers. And I was very, very, I'm very great, you know, grateful for the fact that Joran Passion, who was the prime minister uh, in Sweden at that point of time, did that reform because it was definitely something that, you know, subsidized computers basically put a computer in my home. That was the reason my mom bought it, because it was suddenly much more, um, you know, you got to remember that a computer back then was like $2,000, right? Like it was, it was quite expensive to get. Um, there wasn't really cheap computers to the same degree. And so, no, so that was a, that was a huge, I had a huge interest. And then obviously as you grew up, kind of when internet came along, you started having dial up modems and stuff. Um, I was playing around building like, you know, websites and, and stuff like that. And even, I think sometimes I was paid from some company for doing one or two, but yeah, no, it, it was a fun thing. I've got to ask you, Sebastian, we, we discussed before the valuation of Klarna, uh, reportedly $46 billion. I understand you own about 10% of it, meaning you're a billionaire on paper, at least several times over. Given kind of where you came from and kind of, you know, where you are now, I guess, having no financial worries, at least, uh, how has it changed your life? Please don't say it hasn't. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. No, to kind you of, know, it's, it's a fun question because I once, once I was asked, like, you know, does money make you happy? And then, you know, I think anyone who has had the fortune in life to become financially independent will then say, well, it doesn't and so forth. But I think that is kind of a, to some degree, an answer without perspective, because obviously to your point, you know, I can still remember the, you know, the strange feeling. I mean, I, I would go, I often like, I, I love candy. I love like, you know, uh, buying like an a, a orange juice or whatever, things that I couldn't really afford for myself when I was a kid. And then I, you know, walking by 7-Eleven or one of those places and I would always like, wow, what if I could buy a Snickers? What if I could buy a, an orange juice or something? And then I, I remember just suddenly the sensation of going into 7-Eleven, like, whoa, I could buy everything in the store. Like, it was just like an odd feeling. Uh, <clears throat> So I think to your point, look, I mean, obviously, obviously money makes life easier. Like if I am unhappy or I've had, you know, a bad week or whatever, I can take the kids and I can just go to the local amusement park or whatever. I don't need to look at my account and check if there's money in it, right? That, that's an amazing amount of freedom. And I think that's really the primary, you know, fascination to me was it's about freedom because I always wanted freedom. I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do. And so forth so it's it's given an immense amount of freedom at the same point of time it is you know an interesting experience to be 29 30 and suddenly realize that you don't really have to work right um that you could just stop um because and i think i and and actually interesting enough i think that's why similar to like there's this research that you know 50 percent who win on the lottery become unhappy and stuff like that I think the reason you become unhappy or some people become unhappy is because a lot of us are kind of walking the, you know, the path of life where it's like, okay, I'm supposed to go to university and I'm supposed to get a job. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do this. And then we all read about people coming to the midlife crisis. We're like, was that it? Like, what do I do now? now family's there. Vol you know, in Sweden, we talk about like Villa, Volvo and dog, right? Volvo. So it's like the, the three things are accomplished. And I think usually maybe people get that at 40 50 if you get financially independent you get it early you get it at 30s where you're like 
what am I supposed, like, what am I, what do I want to do? Like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I enjoy? And to not everyone is that, that's an easy question. It's like suddenly that's, that's a challenging question, right? Um, but in, to me, at least, it became very apparent that like, I love my job. I think it's extremely fascinating. I still learn so much every day. I do genuinely feel that like there is a higher purpose in the sense of this industry has made too much money, like the banks make too much money. And if I can like, if through the actions of Klarna, I can make the profitability of banks go, you know, 50% lower on average, like the amount of money that I'm going to return to consumers to allow them to do more fun stuff uh, in their lives, whatever they choose to do with their money um, is just massive. So the impact that we can have is, you know, tremendous. And, and at the same point of time, I'm learning so much. It's a very difficult industry to act, you know, it's regulated, it has, you know, compliance, security risks. It's like, there's tons of fantastic complexity that makes it extremely intellectually stimulating to participate in it. And so I couldn't imagine a more fun place to be. So I, I, you know, from my perspective, that's when I kind of concluded I really want to do this. I want to continue to do this. I don't want to sell or, you know, go surfing or something. I mean, so, yeah. But I don't judge. I don't judge. I think everyone should uh, do what, you know, what's right for them. If you want to go surfing, it's okay. It's okay. So, look, uh, a, key part, <laughs> a key part of this interview, Sebastian, is to get your take on the future of finance. But first... Uh, we're going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with Klarna co-founder and CEO, Sebastian Simetkovsky. Welcome back. And don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. OK, Sebastian, so uh, I want to talk about the uh, future of finance now. Now, since after Stripe, you are, I believe, the world's most uh, valuable uh, fintech. We talked a little bit about the uh, uh, funding round, and I think I also read that you might be raising some debt financing. I don't want to go into specifics about Klarna per se, but if valuations continue to stagnate or fall in the fintech space, though not necessarily for Klarna, should we expect more debt financing? Um, I don't know. I mean, to us, we are a fully regulated bank, so we continuously raise deposits, and we have, just like other banks, multiple debt instruments, some of which are listed and in the public market, some of which are, you know, in the private market, securitizations and so forth. So to me, it's kind of a normal course of business uh, from that perspective. And whether it's buy now, pay later, neobanks, mobile wallets or whatever, that there's far more choice for consumers now than there used to be. Um, does that mean that there is enough competition in the financial services industry? And if not, why not? Well, I think two things, right? So first, if you if you kind of, you know, to answer the question, like, where is finance services going? To me, this was really something that <clears throat> I think we we made, we did a lot of thinking around this in 15, 16, when we kind of pivoted away from competing with Adyen and Stripe and other PSPs and now really becoming a third party network and working in partnership with Stripe and Adyen and others who are now our largest distributors. Um, and I think at that point of time was really when we've kind of pivoted towards the consumer side. And when we when we reflected on that, I think basically the easiest way to describe the future, in my opinion, is that like at some point of time in the future, you and it's a little bit like self-driving cars. I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know that it will happen. <laughs> so, um, but at some point of time in the future, you wake up in the morning and your computer will say something like this. Hey, 
uh, during when you were sleeping, I analyzed your mortgages and I realized that I could save you 10 bucks a month by switching supplier doing something for you. And the only thing you need to do is say yes. Uh, <clears throat> and at that point of time, are you going to ask, uh, does that mean switching from Barclays to something? Like, you're not going to ask, you're going to say, yes, computer, you know, save me 10 bucks. And the only thing you need to do, and then you're done. And off you go to go, you know, do something else. Um, and so when you realize that if you do believe that that's the direction in things are going, uh, and that's why I was, for example, excited when I first saw Dave in the US, which kind of helps you move your credit to the lowest interest bearing account. What it means is it means a lot of things. It means that suddenly in that future where you have that digital financial assistant, currently banking has been about return on assets, return on equity, and to a large degree, uh, banks talk about maximizing interest rate spread, which basically means, if you translate that into human terms, means charging their consumers as much as possible while offering them as little as possible on their deposit account. That's maximizing interest rate spread. So charging as much as possible on that side. That's actually in direct conflict with their customer's best interest. So I think we're moving to a world where, much like when I was reading economy in school, or microeconomics and macroeconomics, we're moving towards a more perfect market because you're reducing, you're removing a lot of the um, inefficiencies that exist in the market today. And that means that the payments industry, means that the banking industry will shrink. It will become smaller, right? So if you look at uh, the in payments industry we're in, it's $16 trillion in retail payments in the markets that we're in, generating about $440 billion of revenue. That's insane, $440 billion. That's too much money that banks have been charging society for moving money between accounts. And this can become much more efficient and will become more efficient. So this whole industry will shrink. And my promise to my investors, I'm very open about this, is that I want us to have a small, a larger piece of a smaller pie. And <laughs> that's kind of all because I want to contribute to this reduction of size of this industry. And so I think that's kind of where the industry is going. But also when you ask yourself like, okay, so who am I as a bank in that position? Well, <clears throat> you can basically be a balance sheet and then you're just, uh, you know, you're just, uh, um, you know, looking for yields. Or you can be the financial assistant. And I think that's where we want to be Klarna. So we, we said, look, I want to be the one who gave you that advice to save you five, 10 bucks, because maybe you'll tip me a dollar for the fact that I gave you the advice, right? If I'm lucky. So that's the position to be in. And that means that future banking is really about data. It's about the data that customers have decided to share with you as a bank. And now you as a bank have to be the best in the world of taking that data that the consumer has decided to share with you and turn it into valuable advice and support to help their economy. The bank that will win is the bank that will be able to prove that the customers who bank with that bank are the best off financially, right? Not the worst off, which we've seen previously with, you know, overdraft fees and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but the best off. That's the bank that's going to win in the future. So, which is great. I think it's very good. Now, from a you know, regulatory perspective and legal perspective and like competitive perspective to, your, to answer your question. How does, how does that happen, right? How is that going to happen? Well, the most critical element is data mobility. The ability for customers to take their data with them and say, I don't trust you, bank number one. I want to go to bank number two, which is the ambition of open banking. Unfortunately, EBA has not fully or has some to some degree restricted the mobility of data and open banking is not living up to its full potential where the UK is now ahead of us in regards to regulation to support that. But that is the key. If all of us as consumers by the click of one button could simply take all of our data from our existing partner bank or you know our, our bank and move it to another bank, you create the true mobility of customers which then forces the banks to actually compete, not by locking your data up, but by actually competing by providing the best services uh, based on the data that you decided to share with them. So that is the key. The key is the data mobility piece to promote that from a regulatory perspective so that we will see this transition of the market. And I think competitiveness wise is still too difficult. We have very poor know your customer email legislation that is a totally useless doesn't protect against terrorism and money laundering.
but at the same point of time creates tons of friction as we move banks. We've all experienced that with tons of extra questions we need to answer and so forth. So banks are super happy about AML and customer. As, as much as they get fined for it now and then, they are happy about it because it has reduced the mobility of customers. And so there's poor legislation like that, but we need better legislation that promotes the mobility because nothing's going to help customers as much as competition. That doesn't mean that occasionally, in addition to that, you need some, uh, you need some, um, uh, some, uh, uh, sorry about that. You need some uh, 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 legislation to obviously also protect consumers from bad practices. But, 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 but in essence, that's it. Okay, uh, so I know we're running out of time, but I just want to, I have to ask you, you know, you mentioned regulators, and I think before you said buy now, pay later is I think about 40% of your, of your business. 60% is buy now, pay later. 60%, I beg your pardon. Uh, but regulators are increasingly looking at this space, concerned that consumers are taking on debts they can't afford to repay, especially as we may uh, be heading towards some kind of recession, according to some uh, analysts and economists out there. Do you buy the argument that buy now, pay later is not necessarily this force for good that kind of allows people to kind of spread their payments and be less financially stressed, but that it actually makes them buy things that they otherwise wouldn't afford and leads to them getting into more debts and more, more Look, I think uh, first and foremost, like <clears throat> we are actually for regulation to some degree here. I don't think that like being totally unregulated is good. I don't believe in anarchies either. I think society benefits from having some rules of interaction. So in general, I think there's some regulation here would make sense. With that said, um, if you actually look at outcomes, you see that our losses are 30-40% below credit card industry standards. Um, you can see that we underwrite in a very different way because we take a credit risk decision on every transaction. Um, and so, and we build people's credit limit very thoughtfully and carefully. So it's a very different model than your traditional credit cards. And again, I think it's like you have to compare credit with credit. If, if you are of the political opinion that you should never use credit for any type of consumption, maybe only for mortgages at most, then I'm not going to win an argument with you. <laughs> like, but if you are as I am, and I think most people are, of the opinion that credit for consumption can make sense, in specific instances, for example, when you shop online and you want to touch and feel the product before you pay for it because you feel more protected by doing that rather than shipping money and then hoping to see the product. If you believe that credit makes sense in some instances, then it's a question of what form of credit should consumers you know, use. And I think the form of credit that we have created has been tried to be constructed in a way where it's actually good for consumers or better than the alternatives that have existed like credit cards, payday lending or tons of other forms that have been out there. And there's even great UK research that suggests that if you try to entirely restrict access to credit, people will go and borrow from family and friends or even from worse places and, and it will create even more stress and so forth. So I, 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 in general, believe that we have a good form of credit. Now, unfortunately, as any form of credit, you will see that sometimes we don't manage to take the right decision and sometimes people overconsume or overuse the product. And obviously, we have to continue striving for becoming even better. And there's some good legislation in Netherlands, in Norway, with creating central databases of credit exposure and so forth, which I think can, are very smart ways to reduce the risk. Because the problem still is, even with open banking today, we can obviously get some visibility into the consumer's full, in, uh, you know, not only ask for income, but actually verify income. We can, we can understand people's entire financial life. But uh, even with that, uh, you know, government could do more here uh, to help everyone in the market. And I think there's some good local initiatives in Europe that are showing great promise in, in regards to that. OK, so look, uh, as I said, I know we're running out of time, but we have just got our rapid fire round sure. of questions, which is 90 seconds. So are you ready? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, most successful fintechs we know are very well funded, but are still losing money hand over fist. Is this to be expected or should we worry about it? Expected, uh, as you saw in nine, 2009. That's great. What fintech segment, aside from yours, has the biggest potential over the next five years? Um, B2B credit at point of sale. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life you'd like to see resolved? All of them. I just don't <laughs> want to think about finances. I want to think about something else. Do you think we're at the beginning, middle or end of the fintech wave? Getting to medium, like, yeah, something like that. 
Do you have a metaverse strategy? No. How would you describe NFTs? A scam, an interesting concept, or part of the future that we really want to be a part of? Uh, I don't know. Like, let people do what they want with their money. <laughs> have you ever invested in crypto? No. Are physical points of sales part of the future of finance? Yes. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 the highest, 1 the lowest, how uh, likely are the following things going to happen? One of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top-tier legacy bank. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Sorry, between 1 and 10, uh, how likely are the following? Mm-hmm. One, of the, a, one of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top-tier legacy bank. 7. CBDCs will become a mainstream reality in the US or EU. Oh, you can answer that one. CBDCs, I'm sure. Yes. I, I, I always forget what that is. <laughs> Central bank digital currencies, will they become a mainstream reality in oh. the EU or US? I haven't yet seen why, but <laughs> maybe. Okay. All right. Well, look, I know we really are out of time. So uh, I really just want to thank you, uh, Klarna co-founder and CEO, Sebastian Simitkovsky, for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you so much, Elliot. I really enjoyed it. Okay, we're going to be back again uh, next week with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We hope everyone watching will join us again then. In the meantime, you can uh, subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel uh, and to follow us on Twitter at Paris Fin Forum. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.